Hello and welcome to the Mega Brave Van channel. Now, I wasn't expecting to do a video about my van under these sort of circumstances, but um, having seen uh, a video um, put online by Hubnut uh, about another Mega Bread Van, or rather another Mega Multi Truck, uh, in fact it's a Phase 1, this is a Phase 2 that I own, um, I thought I'd better sort of give a different slant on things and explain a little bit about uh, the differences between the trucks and in particular mine uh, because I felt I felt a bit disappointed and upset really because the the video that he, he put out didn't really give a good representation of the type. Now I know they get a lot of stick because they're some permi but uh, they are quite useful and I'm quite happy with mine. Um, I think that I think Ian would uh, agree as well. A lot of other owners of vehicles would as well. If they've bought a vehicle because it's a classic or because they simply like it, they can get a bit passionate about these things. But I think that uh, the fact that Madam MB sort of like saw me, made me see um, sense uh, and put things into context a bit. Uh, Miss Hubnut uh, also basically did the same job as as. Um, Madam MB. Um, so I think that uh, we can draw from this conclusion that it's good when you live with somebody, um, in my case my wife, and they sort of look at things from the outside and put a different uh, point of view on things. And I'm very grateful for both um, uh, Ian and Carly for at Hubnut for, um, for making the effort to, to put out a video to explain a little bit of background behind the the video. To be honest with you, the um, the mega van or mega truck that they um, put online, or rather in put online, wasn't a very good example. So yeah, it's got some context into it, and so I find myself now doing this video because I think it's only right to to give my re reply to, to the whole thing. Um, so yeah, the, the truck that was reviewed on the Hubnut channel was uh, a Phase 1, uh, which is quite old now. I mean, that was a 2004 example, and I nearly actually bought one. I nearly bought a Phase 1, and I'm sort of glad I didn't uh, for a lot of reasons. But, um, you know, looking at the engine position being underneath the cab and the lack of legroom um, put me off. Um, I didn't actually see the one I was going to buy. I saw a photograph of it and I spoke to the owner of it. It was up in Rouen, which is quite some way from here. And I'm really, really glad we didn't make that long trip up there to go and have a look. And it just so happened, um, I was looking for a phase two anyway, this one. Um, and uh, I ended up with a phase two, purely because of the fact I didn't see, um, I didn't see why we should have the motor the engine underneath the seats. Um, on this version, they move the engine forwards, and the only thing you have under the seats now is the fuel tank and the battery, which I'll show you a bit later. So, um, Aixam, it's pronounced Aixam by the way, uh, because it's, in fact, Aixam started in the, a town called Aix Le Bon, which is uh, down in the Alps. Uh, I think it was in 1983, I'm not too sure. They bought a company called Ariola which had already been making some Permi cars, very, very simple, small ones. And uh, from that, they started the company. But uh, Mega was actually used on other vehicles before um, the trucks came into being. So we had um, the Mega Track, which is a 4x4 sports car, and another Mega car, which I can't remember the name of, because it's gone completely out of my head, but it was based on the... Uh, Citroen AX I think on the pinnings but it was like a, a bit like a Citroen Mahari type thing um, I shall try to find a picture to put on the, the video um, but that was before the trucks and the trucks came into being uh, in the early 2000s with the phase one uh, my phase two dates from 2011 so um, it was sort of I think they changed the dashboard and various little bits and pieces inside um, between the early uh, Phase 2s and uh, mine because I've seen another Phase 2 online and the dashboard's not the same. 
But um, and then the D truck came along and they uh, replaced uh, well the Phase Two. The D truck is just uh, very similar, really. The only I think the only difference really is passenger comfort, if you could call it that, and uh, different dashboard, different design of cab. The back end is more or less the same. I think the engine is about the same. It's a, a Cuberta 400 cc. Uh, they just updated the electronics and, and things like that. And of course now you've got the electric versions of both the... We have the electric version of the Phase 2 and the electric version of the D-Truck now. Um, I did look at the electric uh, Phase 2 online. And uh, all the ones I saw, the batteries were dead. And they were being sold in the region of 2,500 euros. It's very attractive until you realise that you've got to pay between depending on where you get them from, 2,000 to 3,000 euros for the batteries and then get them fitted. So that, uh, that's one thing I didn't want to do. So now I find myself doing a comparison and I think I'll start with the cab. So I'm very glad to, to get inside and uh, out of the wind because uh, it's not very easy talking to, to the camera when you're tripod is doing this in fact it's not a tripod even it's sort of a selfie stick with a stand on it and so it's very unstable so I think I'll give you a little uh, uh, look around the dashboard and the general things in the cab uh, to a sort of comparison between this and the phase one I think that a lot of things would be pretty obvious when you see if you looked at the original video on the Hubnut channel I, I, I recommend that you do because it's a very interesting video as a comparison but um, I thought, uh, yeah, I'll give you a look around the cab here so you can see what the differences are. So as Ian said in his video, uh, it's a bit cramped in there. Um, you know, I mean, it could be worse. Um, it's not too bad for me. I mean, I'm six foot one and I can fit my, my legs under the steering wheel without any problem. And I actually quite like the driving position. It's very comfortable until you go for a, a road hump or, a, you know, uh, over potholes and things like that. And then it isn't so comfortable. But uh, it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, it's just one bag. It's you know, it's, it's good. Uh, I like sitting upwards and uh, being above things a little bit rather than sitting low down like you know Renault Scenic, which uh, well as I don't have a driver's license, I can't drive it anyway. But I have obviously been in it. Um, the only other thing I don't like is the heater. So for me, it's totally useless. It's something I need to sort out at some point. Um, I'll just stick the ignition on so I can sort of give it a try. But you've got sort of three positions, and you just put it on full. It's already on the hot position there, and the blowers are down here at the bottom. I've got one of them's closed. You've got like little flap type things that you can open. Here it's broken. There's there's no flaps at all. But at the moment, the air coming out is cold because the engine isn't switched on. Uh, even with the engine on, it's just, uh, you know, it doesn't really achieve a great deal. So either there's a fault with the heater uh, or uh, it's just like that anyway. I haven't got a clue, but uh, yeah. Less said about that, the better. Um, as for the dashboard, one thing that can be misleading is you've got the fuel gauge just here and uh, sometimes you can get to the sort of last bar and it's a bit vague on whether you've actually got any fuel or not so really uh, I tend to have it refueled when I'm sort of like probably onto the second to last because I don't want to run out of fuel uh, that would be very silly um, generally it's a very simple dashboard uh, it's wishful thinking that we've got 50 kilometers um, uh, sorry, 80 kilometres an hour, 50 miles an hour on here. Um, as far as I know, this van will actually go up to 55. But that's because the previous owner uh, got the, um, the dealership where I bought it from, because they were maintaining the van for them. Um, they slightly debreeded it a lot. Uh, debreeder in French is uh, to unlimit the, the accelerator. Uh, the van was owned by uh, a bakery before, uh, based near Paris, so they probably needed a little bit of nippiness to get around the traffic, if you can call it that. So basically you've got the 
Um, well, I've got the handbrake on at the moment, so you've got the warning light for that. Uh, on the other side, you've got neutral. Uh, you've got an oil warning light, a battery warning light, fuel warning light, which uh, is a bit vague even with the bars. Window wipers, wash wipe, and indicators on this side, which uh, I learned now that they came out of a, a Citroen Berlingo uh, parts bin. So they're the same as on the phase one, basically. So I think we'll we'll start her up. Um, generally what I do, because I've had problems starting, and I've realised that, well, since changing the battery, uh, there was still a few problems starting, but what I tend to do now is I, I turn on the ignition so that the glow plug light comes on, and wait for it to click. There you go, and it's clicked to say that uh, it's, it's lit up and whatever. So now I turn it off again, and then I start. And usually it starts, but today it's extremely cold. Ah, here we go. There we are. I managed to coax it into life. So hopefully you can still hear me okay with the external microphone. You've got, if you look down here, you've got the accelerator pedal, which is tiny. And you've got the, the brake pedal, and that's your lot. So, if I give it a little blip of the accelerator, you have to be wearing the right shoes. Now, I tend to prefer to wear shoes that have got a very thin sole, because otherwise, if I wear, for example, if I wear a pair of trainers, then I can't actually feel what I'm pushing with my foot, and I don't like that. So. So as you can hear, a full throttle, which would mean 55 uh, kilometers an hour, it's true that it's very loud, it's very loud, but um, I have no soundproofing in my engine at the moment, and uh, it's something I've bought and I need to put in, but also I need to sort out the soundproofing in the cab, because I have none. Uh, there's the roll cage just here. Uh, which unfortunately is attached to the chassis just behind the engine so any engine noise and vibration that you get from it comes through comes through this tube on either side of the, the cab so there's no chance of actually having any quietness in that sort of sort of situation so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some lagging around these poles eventually and the idea as well is to have some sort of insulation on the on the on the um, the ceiling headliner of some sort the things I need to think about you know but uh, those would be the two first things to do really to reduce sound uh, well reduce the the noise basically um, there's not a lot else you can do some people have said that if you you put um, if I can just whiz the camera around if you put uh, something on the the backboard here of the cab that could help as well with the, the noise levels there's lots of things I need to look at so any suggestions that you might have will be very welcome I think we'll turn it off now because I think we've had enough of the noise uh, so as was said in the other video we have a gear stick but it's not quite the same as in the phase one and I actually prefer this one because in the phase one the gear stick seems to look very vague and, and very small I've actually had to work on this one because uh, one of the micro switches decided it didn't want to work anymore. And uh, that was like the first thing I learned about on this van uh, in the fact that, um, you know, I know nothing about the electronics, but uh, it was a case of trying to work out why I couldn't get uh, neutral uh, on the screen when I was uh, changing the gear back from drive to neutral, reverse to neutral. Um, it, it just wasn't working so basically inside here you've got two micro switches you've got one micro switch for drive neutral and one for reverse neutral and I think if one of them fails then neutral fails anyway uh, it was very, very very strange situation so anyway I bought a micro switch it cost me about 10 euros or something like that and I just replaced it and just changed the connectors and job done so I like this gear stick because it's 
you know, it's a bit rickety because it's not very, it's not attached very well to the dashboard. And the whole dashboard itself is the same as in the phase one in that the plastic is awful. I mean, I can move it. So obviously when it's vibrating, um, then it's not very good. So anyway, the gear stick, you push it in and forwards and that's it. In fact, I think I'll just turn the ignition on so you can see that. So if I push it in, and it goes into drive on the screen there. And then if I pull it back and let go, so I'll do that again. You push it in there to go to drive. When you pull it back to let go, and it will go into neutral on its own. And then to go into reverse, you pull it back and you pull it out and that gives you reverse which is probably something they addressed after seeing that the the gear stick in the phase one was totally useless to take it out of reverse you just push it back in again let go so in each case if you're going to go into drive and then you need to go into neutral you just pull it back and it will go into neutral if you're going to reverse okay and you want to go into neutral you just push it and it will go into neutral so it's a really well conceived gear stick compared to the one on the phase one uh, going back to the state of the, the dashboard yes it is is very flimsy uh, the plastic's not very good um, I've got a glove box down there and it used to have a door on it but these the holes holding the door in um, were actually held in with a, a washer and a screw when I bought it uh, I didn't really bother testing the glove box when I looked around the thing before I bought the um, you know mega bread van but uh, I filled the holes in because I thought at a later date I could do something else or re-drill the holes or whatever. But to be honest with you, I left it as it is because when you put something in the glove box, the door tends to come open on its own. So that's not ideal. Here you've got a space for a, a radio, stereo and so on. I decided not to have one because I've got a little Bluetooth speaker and I use my phone if I want to listen to music lighter here which is ideal for powering up usb stuff uh, this little cubby hole here is actually for an ashtray uh, i wouldn't fancy having the idea of somebody smoking in here so i actually bought a round usb um, plug thing uh, you've got uh, several plugs and uh, i'll have to show you in another video but it fits just about in that hole so that's got to be fitted you've got speakers underneath the the dashboard uh, one each side uh, I've never tried them out um, I never bothered to I don't know whether there's actually speakers in there because of the fact that the way the dashboard is um, you can't really feel behind it very well uh, below this binnacle is the fuse box, fuse box or the, like the multiple chocolate block type thing with the fuses in um, ideally it would be nice to have actual box with a lid on it so I can actually look at the fuses, but at the moment I have to lie on the floor and it's dangling down from two wires underneath there, which is not ideal. And at the moment, the only thing I can think of doing is to perhaps slice into the dashboard in some way so that I can have it so the, the wires are coming through the dashboard and then have, a say, a box of some sort uh, plugged or attached onto here. Um, so that's that's one thing that uh, isn't exactly brilliant. Um, so we spoke about the, or rather Ian spoke about the the windows. Sorry about that. I just caught my hand on the the cable for the microphone. Um, yeah, uh, it is a bit fragile. I admit the if you if you pull on the handle, it's not going to come off. I mean, I've had this van since 2018. I've not had any problems so far. You just have to be gentle. So you can turn that. Oh, it makes a lovely noise. That's because I've not done that for a while. So, yeah, it winds down okay. I need to sort out this. That's been like that for some time. It needs gluing back to the door. And, in fact, the whole door needs looking at because... Um, I think that it had, at some point, if I can just get out, at some point there was a knock on the on the door when it was, uh, it was with the previous owner. Um, 
so there's a nice big scratch on there and then at the bottom here you've got I don't know which side it is I think it's the inside yeah it's the inside um, you can see that if I pull on the the door so I get some light because I can't see what I'm doing if I pull on the door you can see it all the way up it moves so it's not attached here basically so if I, I can actually get the panel and push it in it's cracked all along here it's a nice big uh, big crack uh, just here where my finger is so and there's a crack here too so it's a constant fight really to just get back in to keep on top of things and Carl I'll close the window because it's actually pretty cold today Although the wind seems to have died down. So visibility, visibility, uh, not too bad. Nice big mirrors. I had to replace them. Uh, in fact, one one on one side was okay, I suppose. But uh, on the, I think it was the near side one, um, the glass is actually broken, and they uh, gaffer taped a mirror into it. So that wasn't ideal. And this side. With the vibration, uh, the mirror would just fall over because the ball joint was shot in inside the, the fixing there. So, I mean, I'm going to have to wind the window down again, letting all that cold air and that lovely noise. So, yeah, you can, you can move it about as you want. So that's pretty good. Talking of mirrors, we have... Although it's a bit pointless, we have an interior mirror. Uh, obviously, um, on this one, there's no back windows, so I can't see out the back. But this mirror is actually useful. I've angled it so that I can see the blind spot that way. And I found that quite useful. So I was thinking about taking it off, but I don't know whether there's any regulations about having to keep uh, a mirror there or not. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think the last thing to do will be to... Let's give the wipers a try because, well, I'm comparing this to a, a Hubnet video, so we have to have some wipers, don't we? So it's the same as on the phase one, and you've got the wash on the end of the the wiper. And it's, not, it's it's good for what it is, and this one parks. I'll do it again. That's on the fast speed, obviously. So if I put it into the middle, it will park. So that's an advance on the phase one. It parks. Um, the only other thing, oh, the other thing I don't like as well uh, is the fact that the horn's not working at the moment, and I don't know why. So, yeah, and that happened after I was working on um, the subframe and painting it, so God knows what I did. A quick look under the seats. So on this side we've got the fuel tank. So the so I've put a cover on here which is completely useless. Uh, I need to change it. But the uh, little lever is just to the side here. And you can pull it up and inside. Well you can't really see a lot but you've got the fuel tank which is down there. But you've handy, got a handy little cubby hole as well. So that's uh, that's quite good actually. So there I've got my warning triangle, which I have yet to use, and fluorescent jacket, a little hoover, and jobs are good in. You can actually move the seats back and forth, but uh, that's not really ideal either, because, uh, well, my size being six foot one doesn't really achieve a great deal. So that's that side. We go around to the passenger side and have a look around there. The same thing here, you've got a lever at the side that you can pull on. So there you've got the you've got a cover. Ignore my turtle wax and air freshener thing. So you lift that up, you've got the battery underneath there. That's a new battery that I fitted uh, two years ago now, I think. Previously it was a Peugeot Citroen one that they got from, the seller got from God knows where, which was about dead. Um, but I decided to invest in a new battery. So some people say that if you put some soundproofing on these panels, 
Uh, you haven't got one on the other side, but that can also help as well to deaden the noise of the engine because obviously if you lift that up you've got road and uh, not a lot of protection in fact when I had the battery fitted I asked the, the bloke at the local garage so I bought a box here and he got to he got he managed to sorry he managed to fit the, the box unfortunately because the the battery is quite tall there's not a lot of space underneath to fit the cover so I got to think of something there as well, but uh, it was a job to uh, to get the battery out, I think, because you had to do it from underneath, and that's the reason I got the garage to do it, because I didn't want to crawl about underneath the van trying to do that. Besides, he did a good job anyway, and he's a nice chap and all that. So to open the bonnet, you've got a lever which is somewhere in between the, uh, the pedals. Um, uh, it's just above the got this bolt here that's uh, holding the accelerator pedal onto the cable and then just to the left of that you've got a lever just in here to open the bonnet which you just pull on so if I can get my hand underneath so thankfully you haven't got the radiator under your seat it's here uh, unlike the phase one so it's basically the same engine, it's a Kubota 400cc and you've got the CVT unit down there at the bottom so that's out of the way as well although I probably can't really film it the way that Ian did in his video because uh, obviously it's under here and it's not underneath the seat so anyway, it's an ideal place for it to be so you've got the binnacle there for the, the clock radio and the I think the ventilator's in there as well and it's all very simple. Um, got what I, I think are aluminium McPherson type struts, and you've got the coil spring suspension is just behind there. I think you can see it better on this side underneath the screen wash. Um, it's just down here. Now, I've not bothered to, to see if they're any good or I haven't changed or anything. So that's probably why the ride is a bit bumpy. Right, take two, because I tried to film the CVT and my camera moved. So we just put the glow plugs on and we'll give it a start up. The camera doesn't seem to have moved. Good. So what I'm going to do is do a quick demonstration of how the CVT works. As you've probably seen in, uh, in Ian's video, um, the, the two discs either side of the belt expand and open which make the spindle inside smaller uh, in fact it's not a spindle it's like uh, the disc has got a, a beveled edge and the fact that they move apart the belt slips down in between the two beveled edges and changes the ratio so I'm going to give a quick demonstration of that now so you can go up or down So I could accelerate quicker than that even. So unlike on the, the phase one in the other video, the belt isn't slipping. So basically it is working correctly. Uh, I've never had to change the belt on it. And that's, well, I've had it since 2018. I haven't done a great deal of, of uh, mileage on it. So when I bought the van, the engine, um, seemed to be fine, I uh, didn't seem to any problems with it. Um, it came with, from a dealership, uh, it came with um, a three month guarantee and uh, I assumed that everything was okay. Um, I didn't, I, I suppose I put too much confidence in the, the dealership. And then just after the guarantee finished, after the three months, uh, Madam MB was using the van to take some things down to the local tip, which is uh, about three kilometers away. And I was teaching that morning, so um, it was quite a shock when I was teaching somebody to see uh, my van come back being towed by my brother-in-law because basically it had broken down on the, the bypass around our village. And what had happened was that the, 
the radiator had just boiled. Um, you know, there was little coolant in it. I'd never noticed any leaks beforehand. And I can only assume that when I bought the van, they hadn't filled it up properly, which blew the engine, basically. Uh, there was apparently, according to Madam MB, there was smoke coming out the bonnet. Um, it was black smoke coming out the exhaust. And she was really quite concerned that uh, we just bought this van and three months later uh, it had blown up. And earlier in the year, we'd had a similar problem with our Renault Scenic when the engine had blew on that too. So it wasn't a very good year that year. Um, in that case, it was a, a turbo failing. Anyway, I got back onto the dealership, not very pleased. Um, they agreed to source a, a, a new second-hand engine and fit it for me. And then I had to pay the, the transport costs and everything as well, because obviously it had to be taken on the back of a lorry down to, to the dealership. But, um, you know... Uh, I managed to get some money back on the deal because he, he mischarged me on the transport. So the fitted new engine, um, it had, when I bought the van, it had 88,000 kilometres on it. And presently, we can see that it's got 89,524. So I've not done a great deal of driving. So the engine was replaced um, with the uh, a new second-hand engine, as I've just said. Uh, and that had... 27,000 kilometres on it. I just have to take their word for it. So that was fitted. And since then, there's not been any problems. I mean, I've been topping up the radiator and there's been one oil change since then, uh, which is done by the local garage. And so far, so good. So I'll give you a quick tour around the exterior. Uh, now we've done the inside. And I'll take it for a drive a bit later on. So most of the changes have been around the front, really, because I've, I've modified the... The front panel, as you've seen in earlier videos, so I won't go into too much detail, but uh, I just wanted it so the panel could be removable. And so I can remove it from the side there with a few bolts. And if I can just move my shadow out of the way, um, I'll put a panel underneath so I can attach it to this protection bar, which is fitted by my brother-in-law. There's another video about that as well, if you have a look. So basically that's the biggest change. Um, so it makes it easier to get at things like the, the fuel feed filter which is down there at the front underneath the panel and everything else really. And when I painted the the front subframe which you can just about see underneath the the bell part of the CVT um, it, was, it was quite useful for that. And apart from that I've replaced the the hubcaps, I bought them from a, a company on eBay based in the northeast of England. I think it was about 100 quid for the four. And I painted the painted the rust protected the, the wheels and the, the subframe at the same time, as well as the side protection bars and the rear protection bar, because they were very rusty. Uh, they were getting very crispy. And uh, I did those about two years ago I think and they're painted with hammerites plus protected undercoated a spray on undercoat like if I just sprayed the bits that were rusty but not the bits I'd protected because the paint was intact on the main part of the bar most of the rust was obviously from water being and muck and god knows what being thrown up by the wheels onto the ends of the protection bars and here I I repaired the end of it because the plastic cover had gone and I didn't know where to get one. So that is from a Nutella jar. And again, painted with hammerite. So body work wise, it wasn't too bad. Um, the only things there are are a few little nicks on the side there and there's a nice big crack there. Somebody probably tried to get into the, the doors because someone's put a, a lever of some sort uh, um, I don't know, a, a jemmy or something to get the doors open. The hinges need replacing at some point because they're a bit broken. They're not broken to the, st the stage where uh, I can't sort of open the doors or anything, but they need doing eventually. Um, yeah, so the outside is, is correct, it's fine. Um, the inside needs a bit of work. Um, but I think the problem mainly is the fact that here in this part of France, or in lots of parts of France, 
the weather has been extremely hot during the summer and as today it's freezing cold so i think the extremes of temperature doesn't really help with the plastic uh, i mean unlike the the phase one in the other video i haven't got panels falling apart on the inside and gaps in the in the door pillar or anything like that but um it's something i need to keep an eye on i need to find new ways of repairing things um I mean, so far, all I've repaired is the, the floor because there was a tiny, there's a hole about that big in the corner of the floor. Um, and uh, I decided to try using epoxy putty to try to repair it. But with the, the damp and then the heat uh, acting on it, it just fell off. I mean, it was there for about six months and it was like um, it didn't actually bond very well. And then um, I think it's my brother-in-law told me about uh, making up some slurry with plastic. So I looked online about that. I think he'd used it to repair a, a mudguard on his motorbike. He used a, a block of Lego to, because it's white, um, a white block of Lego to put into some acetone and made some slurry. So I did the same thing because I had to repair the front panel, which I've just shown you. I cut the bottom off it because the, the bottom part was all broken. And used this excess plastic that I'd managed to recuperate and created some slurry with that and repaired the floor. So really it's keeping on top of things with this van. Like with any vehicle, really. It's just it's slightly more fragile than most. Uh, and I'm actually surprised because I thought that things would break more often than they do. Uh, but onwards and upwards, I'm going to try to improve things and, you know, just keep things going. That's what you do. Um, and generally I'm happy with my van uh, it probably gets a lot of stick even in France in France uh, some permi cars are called yogurt pots but you have to remember that these vehicles are you know they're, they're, they're part of life in France because public transport in a lot of places is so bad uh, that you know people need to get about young people need to get about they can be driven from when you're 14 so um you know that's who these companies you know the citroen ami uh exam uh this year are marketing to if you look on their instagram accounts a lot of their pictures show happy teenage owners uh so they fill in a gap in what is lacking in france but for me my van is there because i like it and because i want to keep it going and maybe one day it will become a classic in its own right. I mean, it's, it's, it's barely 12 years old. But, you know, in time, there's going to be fewer and fewer of them. The downside for me is that uh, where, where spares are concerned, um, the, um, everything that's engine and front subframe, there's no problem because it's the same as the XM400 cars. And there's a lot more of those around than my van. But when it comes to bodywork parts and the chassis, the ladder chassis underneath, which I think is stainless steel with aluminium bits on it, then those are going to be something that are going to be difficult to find. Uh, and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And of course, with it being diesel, uh, it's not going to be very popular with electric coming in. But, you know, I mean, I'm, what, 53 now. And uh, the... The ban on sort of um, fuel powered cars is in 2040, so probably um, I'll be too old to to drive it around anyway. Um, well, 53 uh, it's in what 20, 20 years time, 53, 63, 73. I might still be driving it. Uh, I might have bought something else. I might have a Citroen Ami or something of the equivalent. I don't know. That's the future. But while I can, I'll keep my van going and I'll keep my channel going. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll be happy to do that. So I'm going to sort of like take it out for a drive. Probably not today because it's freezing cold and uh, I've got some other things I need to get doing. But the last part of the video will be driving it.
right, off we go. So what we're going to do, that's the limit of the village over there. And uh, we're just going to drive from one, one end of the village to the other. Now, all of the roads in the village are now limited to 30 kilometres an hour. Uh, which is a bit of a, a joke for my van because obviously I can only go up to 50 anyway. But... Uh, so I'll take you through the, it's not through the centre of the village, the road that goes parallel. Now you've got the park that you've seen in another video. So, um, we're going on the roads parallel to the centre of the village. And you'll see there's loads of uh, road humps. But, uh, like I said, I'm limited to 30. And it's very easy to speed, if you can call it that. So bit of hill climbing. I'm actually doing 30 deliberately. Alright, it's 30, 35. Whoa! Be careful here, because this road is uh, sort of two-way. It's one way further up. And it's a section I'm turning into where you've got... Uh, oops. Should be careful, because it's a bit narrow here. There you go, you get a little surprise you like that round here. You sort of think there's, there's no traffic. Uh, should have slowed down for that. There's no traffic and then suddenly somebody appears. So we're coming up to a junction. Whoops, there you go. Again, I should have slowed down. And I'm actually breaking the speed limit. <laughs> so you come to this junction here the priorities are a bit weird because you have to stop here and let anybody coming down this road to the left say right of way and of course you've got the famous priority idle act which uh, we haven't got along this stretch so that used to be a lovely park and over there you've got the chateau and a few years ago or a few years ago I think it was probably getting on for eight seven or eight years ago we had some Gypsies camp on the park. That's the the park was private. There's another road hump. The owner of it didn't really like that very much, so he dug a load of embankments and put fencing around it, so we can no longer go in the park, which is very sad. I used to enjoy going there when my kids were little. By the way, we've got Emma filming me today because it's half term. So I'm very grateful for her to, to do that for me, otherwise this video would be very difficult to do with just me on my own. So here we've got a, a bit of a blind bend and it narrows. I'm still doing 30. And then here you've got to stop again. You have to care, be careful on the right, you've got a farm. It's a sort of stables where everyone leaves their horses to be taken care of. So up there you've got the Mary, and there you've got the farm. And sometimes you get uh, traffic uh, coming out of there. Here you have to be careful as well. There you guys, I can't call when you're in the way. So we'll take the, what's called the Chemin de Marais. It's very quiet down here, there's no traffic. But I think it's still 30 down here as well. And that's the other end of the village. So it's not a very big place where I live got some fields over this side that are owned by the stables. You do show jumping and stuff over there. And over there you've got the road going down to the next village, which you can't really see very well from there. Oh, we've got some nice horse monk to go through. 
So this is full of potholes, as we've seen in the previous video, probably. The winter doesn't really help. It's been resurfaced probably twice in the last few years. And each year, you get loads of holes. It's not as bad as it was, because I couldn't have drunk, driven like this before. You know, I would have had to basically do the slalom. And I'm still in, I'm 25, 25. Since you up to 30. So, I hope you've enjoyed the video. A little uh, comparison with uh, the video that Hubnuts put up. Um, obviously, I'm, I can't go fast speeds at the moment because it's 30 in the village and I haven't quite ventured out into the big wilds of going to the next village yet. Uh, so that's going to be the next thing to do. Probably for the uh, 300th video. I don't know, we'll see. So thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you in another video. Take care, bye. Is that my mouth or my face? Support. Mega. Red. Van. Hill. Yeah.